I think if I hear you call me Becky one more time, six pack, I'm gonna pop your tops. All six of them. Who are you? Hey, this is Matt once again. What about to another review? There's another Patreon request, this time from Albin. Thank you so much for that. If people are interested in requesting any type of review or re-review, reaction, topic, any type of video, you can either join me on my Patreon or send a request directly to my PayPal. Both links are down below in the info box. Now, for this, for this time, Albin wanted me to talk about Sharky's Machine from 1981, which was... A film that was directed as well as stars Burr Reynolds. Now Burr Reynolds is greatly missed. I think he was a very talented guy. Made a lot of great movies. Whether it be Smoking the Bandit. And Cannonball Run. And he was in Boogie Nights which I reviewed. He did a good job in that. Very talented actor. And uh, this was not the first time he directed. He had done two films before this. One called Gator. Which was a sequel to a previous film he starred in. And also, he directed a film called The End, where he also starred in with a good buddy of his, Dom DeLuise. Now this was pretty much him taking his toe in the Dirty Harry direction. I mean, he was even nicknamed Dirty Harry Goes to Atlanta. Part of me thinks the reason that Burr Reynolds did this is because he had a friendly rivalry with Clint Eastwood. I said, oh, Clint, you're coming to my territory now, how? When Clint did the film Every Which Way But Loose. Because Every Which Way But Loose was a comedic movie and seemed like a fun film, like the type that normally Burt Reynolds was starred in, but then Clint did it, and that became a huge success. So then Burt would, you know, not harshly, just a friendly type of thing. Oh, you don't step into my territory, huh? Well, I'm going to step into yours. So he did this movie. And while this is not nearly as good as any of the other actual Dirty Harry films, because it's a movie dealing with cops, and that's why he says Dirty Harry in Atlanta, because it's a action, hard-hitting cop movie, uh, it's still a pretty decent film. I thought Burt Reynolds did a fairly decent job directing. Uh, one of the big positives of the film is the cast. You know, Burt does a good job. You also have Charles Durning, Brian Keith, Bernie Casey, uh, Charles Durning. Worked with Burt Reynolds quite a bit. He was also in the original When a Stranger Calls and the TV sequel When a Stranger Calls Back. Uh, Charles Durning's done quite a lot of other stuff. Brian Keith was with Burt Reynolds and Hooper, which is my personal favorite Burt Reynolds film. Bernie Casey, he's been a ton of stuff, including... Revenge of the Nerds, among others. Henry Silva, who would become the bad guy in Code of Silence and Above the Law. He's in this as a hitman who loves to take drugs. At the end, gets so high on, I, I want to say he's PCP, I forget the actual drug, that even gunshots won't stop him. Pretty crazy finale, I will say. Rachel Ward... She's in this as what will eventually become the love interest of Burt Reynolds. 
I will say with the film, I liked it. I don't love it. I think it's a bit too long. I think the middle portion is a little bit slow. Not as exciting or interesting. I like the setup of the film. You know, Burr Reynolds, this dumbass guy, screws up his case, screws up his deal. So the shit hits the fan. And he's got to chase this bad guy into a bus. And he's able to shoot the guy, but the guy hurts the civilian in the process. So Burt Reynolds couldn't really do a whole lot. He just busted down from the higher up down to Vice. So now he's dealing with hookers, prostitution rings, things of that nature. And that's where he meets up with Brian Keith and Charles Durning, who's the captain, and Bernie Casey and all these other guys. Now, they look in the cases with these hookers, including this one who is a $1,000 a night hooker. While they lease another, they find out via these wiretaps that he gets a buddy of his to do that there are links to this candidate for governor. And like, oh shit, there's something going on here. And so uh, the beginning portion works because the, t- the chemistry between the characters, I thought, worked well. You know, Charles Durning, it's, sometimes it almost seems as if it wants to be a parody of those type of Dirty Harry Cop shows because there is some humor in this. Not slapstick humor or anything, but for example, there's a moment where they find out who the hit man is and there's this picture and Charles Dirty's like, let me see it. And it goes from one cop, then the other, then the other. And Charles Dirty can't get until he finally like, give me that picture. There's certain moments like that that feel fairly comedic. To Again, to the point that for a second, like, is partial of this supposed to be a parody? But no, it's, supposed, it's levity. That's what's supposed to be levity and humor. But And it was fun, so I appreciate those moments. It was just a bit weird and I won't say off-putting, but like, okay, but still fun. But then when Burr Reynolds is having a stake out watching Rachel Ward, who plays this hooker named Domino, she also has these dance classes, all that stuff, and he keeps watching her and watching through binoculars. That's where it slowed down a bit. I thought it slowed down a bit, and to be perfectly honest, I didn't care about the love story between Burt Reynolds and Rachel Ward. Not that they were bad, but if you were to ask me what my least interested part, like what part was the least interesting to me, the least intriguing to me, it'd be the love story. Which Maybe that's why Clint Eastwood knew not to put too many love stories in his Dirty Harry films. Maybe even he knew, ah, fuck that shit. I ain't working in these movies. Nah, not working in these movies. Sorry, Bert. Sorry, but ain't gonna work. Nah. I mean, the closest one he got a little bit with dinner with the reporter in the Deadpool. But even though that, that worked out, I thought better than this. In between them, there are some good moments. Bernie Tacy, his character, I liked. I liked the, when he tells his story to Bert where... He was on the drop of this guy and like the guy had a gun and there's this other woman and Bernie Casey talks about how he just disappeared. He just made it so that he wasn't there. Whether lack of emotion, lack of being there. So the guy had a gun but then just wandered off and did something else. And I thought, okay. But that does come back later, so I thought that was actually interesting that that story actually comes into play in the finale. So I thought that was pretty clever. And there's some harsh moments, like there is some harsh moments in this film. You know, Henry Silva as the hitman, he'll be more than willing to just shoot through a door and then you see through the hole and you see a faraway shot of this woman with no face. 
It looked like she literally had no face. I guess she was so far away, they were able to get away with that with the ratings board. But it's like, ooh, shit. And there's some interesting points of direction by Bert. Like, they have this montage where they're looking for clues. Bert's threatening this potential candidate. It's all be done in a montage with no words, no dialogue, just music. So, I mean, that, that was a bit interesting. So, yeah, I don't think this need to be two hours long. I think the whole love story thing, I don't know if it needed to be a love story. It could have just as easily been, I want to protect this girl because it's the right thing to do. Again, the, the love story, I, I don't think it worked, in my opinion. Again, I think that's why Dirty Harry films are more successful because they didn't do much of that shit. To me, it was for the better. And also, Bird made some dumb decisions. At this point, the bad guys think this woman, Domino, Rachel Ward's character, is dead. These even point early on, like, hey, they think you're dead. Let's keep it that way. But then he goes to this bad guy who's in this, like, he's got all these women on him. The guy still thinks Domino is dead. And Burke goes, she's alive. Oh, what's that look on your face? Like you're puckering up? Like, I'm like, why the fuck did you do that? Why the fuck did you tell him that she was alive? For your ego? So you can go, you're fucking up my city. We just fucked up the case, asshole. Talk about the character, not Bert. The character. What the fuck are you doing, Sharky? Shitty, goofy, dumbo, court. What the fuck are you doing? Why are you telling him? You're telling the bad guy. And because he did that, now the bad guys are adamant to find her. Thus resulting in some people he knows getting killed. And some other shit happening. That was the bad fucking thing to do. And once in a while, there's a bit of weird business, like one of the bad guys has these two kung fu henchmen. The first time we see them kill an informant, they look like ninjas. And you know, instead, they're just like these two kung fu henchmen that knock out Bert and bring him to this other guy. And that's when we found out some of his buddies are dead, including the tech guy. And this would I mean like it has some weird tones to it where you know, some people you go to like do end up dying. On the flip side, you got kung fu guys all of a sudden. These two kung fu wannabe ninja guys. I think you have some comedy like one of the, I forget the guy's name. I've seen him in other stuff. He's got shaved bald head. He's one of the guys looking for clues during the investigation and one of his gimmicks is that he'll repeat certain things. Yeah, but I'm telling you, that's the way it, it's I guess someone's play for comedy. So do you get once in a while like a goofy moment, but then you'll have a scene where two of Burr Reynolds' fingers get cut off because they're interrogating him. Or Bert will shoot one of the Kung Fu guys with a spear gun. I mean, I guess you could say at least it has a little bit of a unique flavor of its own. At least it has that. At least the finale is interesting because the guy left is not the head bad guy. It's the hitman, Henry Silva, who again, he's so high on drugs that they keep shooting him. He won't go down. And the thing I talk about Bertie Case's story, that comes into play back here. And like Silver's character is so hopped up on drugs. <laughs> and he did a really nice stunt. Apparently it's still to this day the highest that a stuntman has fallen for the, the finale bit. So again, at the end of the day, I would say I like the film because it's fairly well directed by Bert. It has a really good cast. Charles Durning I like. It seems though in the third act... 
Charles Durning's character disappears? I just found that a bit weird because throughout it, he was fairly apparent in the know of what's going on, what's happening. But then he disappears in the third act. And you would think he would show up somewhere. And he doesn't. So again, I don't know what happened there. I don't know if there was something cut out with Charles Durning or there's something more for him. But it's like after a certain point, you don't see Charles Durning anymore. And Charles Durning was, like I said, fairly apparent in the first half of the film. Second half, not really, so I don't really know why. So that was a bit weird. Again, some of the tone seemed a bit weird. Felt a little bit too long at two hours. The the middle portion, Love Story, Rachel War, was not that intriguing to me. But on the on the flip side, some of the intense moments were, <laughs> like I said, interesting. The moments of violence, not gore, not gore, but violence was surprising. The uh, Burt Reynolds did a good job in the lead. It showed that he can play a more serious role. He's not just Smokey the Bandit, Hooper, Cannibal Run guy. He could play these type of roles and be... Granted, he had done that before in films like Deliverance, but it was another case showcasing that he can play this type of role. He can be taken more serious and would not be ridiculous or silly, quite the opposite. The other cast of characters, they had good chemistry. Bernie Casey and Brian Keith and others. Henry Silva, nice to see him before he would go face off against Steve Zago and Above the Law and Chuck Norris and Code of Silence. It was cool to see an earlier role with Henry Silva. I thought he did a good job. This is right after he was an alligator because this came out in 81. So like I said, Sharky's Machine I would say is a definitely an interesting film in Burt Reynolds career and I did I think directing this starting in this he wanted people to know I'm not just the cannibal run guy I'm not just a smoky and the bandit guy <laughs> give me a chance I could do more and then Sally a few years later he would do that film with Clint Eastwood City Heat where he got horribly injured to the point that he had pain for the longest longest time and it really fucked him up I think something to do like there was a chair that was supposed to smash and it did not go right and it really fucked him up fucked him up badly number one City Heat is a really shitty film disappointing film number two just how much pain throughout the years and that really affected it and then that's when his career really dwindled sadly when you get to the late 80s and early 90s, one of the more notable films, whether well, it's for good reason, that's up to you, I guess, but what, Cop and a Half? <laughs> yes, that, that type of stuff. It, it, he was a striptease with Debbie Moore. I mean, these are the type of roles he was getting when he, the early 90s started, so. And it's too bad. Although I could watch those films for what they are, Cop and a Half is striptease, but you know that's not. They were not smoking the bandit. They were not Hooper, among other stuff. So that's yeah, too bad. And rest in peace to Mr. Burr Reynolds. Very, like I said, very talented actor. And while I, I don't love this film, I do think there's a lot to appreciate in the film. Number one being, like I said, the cast of it. So, with that said, it's worth a watch. Thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.